Good afternoon. My name is Ashutosh Sena, and welcome to this platform. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll be talking about technology and how we can leverage it to build trust for the enterprise. Welcome to the conversation today. The Economic Times and Veritas present Building Trust with Technology. It's a topic that you as a viewer would not want to miss because of the challenges being faced by businesses as they go digital. How can technology help businesses to build trust for their enterprise? You know, the context is very important because the last two years have indeed been very challenging for companies as the pace of digital transactions, digital way of working has multiplied. As a consumer of products or services, have these businesses managed to expand the sphere of their influence in the online world, particularly when they engage with you as a consumer? What are some of the challenges that these companies are facing as their digital presence expands, as their online part of the business expands? How are leaders of IT function deploying technology and data to seamlessly integrate functions and new business and operating models? While they do that, there's been a new challenge that has emerged during these last two years in particular. And let me fall back on some data. During 2021, that's last year, the calendar 21, nearly more than about 11 and a half lakh incidents of cyber attacks were reported by in the country's CERT or the Computer Emergency Response Team. CERT is what they're called, CERT. If, they, if uh, we were to step back into 2020, so a year before that, few would forget the power outage that large parts of India had faced and the malware in the power transmission systems that were suspected for that. So that's another reality of doing business in today's world. So the expanding digital footprint presents a never before opportunity for the enterprise. Well, where there's an opportunity, there is also a problem. It also brings with it a set of challenges, the scale of which has not been seen before. Businesses around the world have been hit by security worries. That's also reality. <clears throat> Excuse me. While we try and break the conversation uh, during this 90 minutes, we'll try and break it into about three parts or so. First, how the companies build a robust platform for the businesses. Second, I'll request the experts to share some of their experiences and insight on how they dealt with challenges and managed the ex to expand the trust that their business enjoys. And third, we'll also ask or talk about the challenges companies face because of the spate of security breaches and some ransomware worries. Now we'll have to be a little careful because there are not everything can be spoken when we're talking security because there are compliance issues. So let me introduce the guests today the speakers, the experts who are going to be joining us. Saurabh Chandra, Managing Director at BCG. Pankaj Kumar Pandey, Head IT in SPI General Insurance. R. Venkatesh, President and Head of Technology, Operations, Human Resources and CIO at DCB Bank. Rajiv Batra, CIO, The Times Group. Nandkishore Dhumne, CIO, Manipal Hospitals. R. Srinivas, He's general manager, IT infrastructure and security at Himalaya Wellness. And Johnny Karam, managing director and VP, International Emerging Region, Veritas Technology. Gentlemen, thanks a lot for being with us. Welcome to the Economic Times. Thank you so much for taking out the time to be with us for this very important conversation. Before we move on, just a reminder to everyone watching us, please do put in your questions in the Q&A tab. We'll try and take some of those questions to the experts uh, so that they answer your questions. And for anyone watching, for you know, people in the industry who are watching, this could be a good way to interact with the experts. 
Let me first, though, uh, request Saurabh Chandra from BCG to put a context to this conversation. Saurabh, good afternoon. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. Thanks, uh, Economic Times and the team behind this for bringing all of us together. Very good afternoon to all who actually took their precious time to deliberate the thought together. Let me just share some context with you, what this subject means for us. Uh, what is building trust with technology means? Um, if we see today so many technologies, so many aspirations, and that's the opening line. With that, if you see India Inc., they pretty much are hungry. They pretty much want to see a great customer experience. They want to have a competitive advantage in the world. They want to have whole talent density go up in the country. They are contributing to infrastructure readiness. All this, and as well as they are also pretty much seeing technology to play a critical role across value chain. Uh, we pretty much can uh, enhance the revenue uh, using technology, getting new leads, onboarding new channels, uh, selling it through various channels. If you see today, there was a time when we, we buy, let's say shirt, uh, we didn't know after 20 days, what kind of a tie we need to buy. Uh, today, technology powers various recommendations for us. So the whole customer experience is getting powered by that. Not only a uh, few of these delights, but also various of fraud prevention, credit monitoring across the industries. The whole tri-party ecosystem is evolving. Uh, there is market which is participating, there is consumer which is participating, and there are uh, so many other entities in the ecosystem which are playing together today. And thanks to technology, it has made this possible for us. The growth, uh, no more, it's about a linear growth in the market. Everybody is talking about how can we grow exponentially. And if you will see a few of the relevant use cases are wherein double digit growths, uh, so much so leading to 100% customer growth in terms of acquisition that the industry has witnessed. And again, lots of technologies behind it. One of the most important one that is taking shape in the industry, which is AI, artificial intelligence. 15% of global companies, they are experiencing a large impact of AI, uh, you know, already. And pretty much this number is growing leaps and bounds year on year. Uh, if you will see the demand, the demand forecast across across the industries is just growing. And it is expected to become 1 trillion demand uh, just to have the AI technologies with us. Pretty much many of the fintechs and banks across the world, if we triangulate the data today, they can witness 150 to 220 billion uh, annual earnings just by using the right technology, including AI. And it can also lead to the cost savings. So if you will see all this, primarily the aspirations are primarily because different challenges. We want to grow. Uh, we want to be more productive as an India Inc. Uh, there are different contexts, uh, consumers, market, competition, and there's different um, focus and levers, uh, technology, innovation, uh, to name a few. Pretty much many technologies are emerging, taking shape. As you can see, cloud, AI, analytics, sciences, blockchain, so many technologies. So much so that what we see as UI, UX, when we go to mobile screen, that simple one screen has so many technologies around it, uh, which actually is powering uh, to give us that experience. And not only that, if we double click on, on the ML AI world, if you will see the right hand side, you will know that in order to take advantage of one such AI or ML, uh, there are so many technologies behind it, voice, speech, NLP, image. Pretty much machine learning is making whole of the process intelligent. You remember 
a shirt with a tie comes handy today on an internet. Uh, and this is only possible by some proactive learnings. Having said that, with so much of aspirations, so many technologies coming into play, therefore the risk. And if we need to take a quick glance of where world is seeing cyber crime as reality, it can actually lead to $6, six trillion of size of investment to stop that. But this also can be done via technology. Uh, the complexity is increasing. Uh, pretty much many of the companies who are on this journey, the fact says out of four, only one succeeds in this particular journey of technology transformation. So many technologies, so many business aspirations. And that's why it's very important to build trust with technology. And that's what our theme today is. I'll open up the floor and hand it over to Ashu to take the baton on. Oh, that's a very good and big uh, overview that you've shared, Saurabh. Thanks a lot for sharing that. So let's start with that trust factor because that's what businesses are all about. So many businesses that thrive on that word, the trust that they are able to build with consumers. Just about any business you'd say, they have to be driven on that trust with consumers. So, Pankaj Pandey from SPI General Insurance, I'd like to know from you, in a technology-led world, how can that trust be multiplied? What should be the building block for that trust to be multiplied? Yeah, so we are, we, we are talking about the trust of consumer on any business. Now in what a customer wants from any business, they want ease of use, they want their transaction to be secured, and they want all the services on, on fingertips. So what we need, we need a, and, of the, and the performance, the expectation of customer is now, it is like uh, increasing day by day, and it is not limited to your competitor in your own industry, that is across. So if we are talking about a customer is expecting, is getting some service from some service provider, suppose like a telecom service provider or your e-com service provider, the expectation is that if they are inter interacting with any other business house, suppose like us insurance company, then they should get the same level or same type of or same uh, ease of use. Uh, so expectation is across. Secondly, now the... Uh, they are getting from different channels, they want the same type of service. And secondly, they don't want that different treatment should be given when if they are uh, they are communicating with the company or they, they want to get the service or they want to purchase something. So sales or service, they want the same type. So one is ease of use. Second is performance. And third is the Sec uh, uh, the security of data because that is the perception uh, the the news that they are reading across and from many business houses and the news every day coming out that some data is hacked or credit card of something uh, so, some something is gone so that trust has to be given to them that the every everything is secured mm -hmm. you are not going you are not going to lose anything and uh, uh, that that robustness and the performance that that has to be assured to the customer in, di okay. in, di in, di in different way and that should be continuously reinforced. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, so that robustness and comfort needs to be given to the consumer. At the same time, I'd imagine uh, Nankishore Domne, NK, as well, I'll prefer to call you as we discussed NK. Uh, Without saying that, often businesses don't have to say that that they have, as a consumer, you have that assurance. They don't speak about that. You're in a very sensitive sector, healthcare, where that is very important. How can the customers be given the ease of use or you know an experience better than competitors? Should I say that? 
why not discussing that with the consumer with your with your customer well first of all good afternoon and thanks for this opportunity being here on this platform uh, so coming back to your question with respect to uh, why not talking to our customers and understand as to what is that uh, they expect from us as a part of the service delivery well, yes uh, i mean in addition to what uh, nihal has said uh, definitely we have to sort of you know uh, go to the customers uh, uh, at a very regular intervals and sort of understand as to what kind of services they would expect from us while we have our own strategies our own uh, you know um, uh, plans uh, in place to enhance the customer expectations but if those plans are not supported by the actual feedback whether that is coming from uh, you know the social media or maybe uh, there are different ways of interacting with the customers so if that plan is not supported on a regular basis uh, with the customer feedback uh, i don't think uh, any uh, you know uh, strategy which we have in place to deal with the customer satisfaction uh, will be very effective for all of us so i think it's a very important point and even uh, you know uh, while we deliver the services many times uh, for example i myself can go to the hospital and seek those services this so opd or uh, you know the ip service or even take some kind of home services so when i get that feedback right i get that experience it's a very important uh, you know piece of information which i can use you know uh, to improve uh, uh, our plans in terms of uh, how i can strengthen my customer facing you know systems and secondly uh, uh, also a lot of you know friends are there who take those services so if we are kind of connect with them and also understand their experiences when they avail the services from uh, our organization i think uh, these are various channels which will make you aware uh, about uh, what is the kind of services you are offering and then you come back and sit down and understand whether technology can help to improve services or a process can help so there are two three areas you can you know look at the people the process the technology so those are the tools which can be used to improve those services going forward that's my take on this okay let's try and take the example of some very specific businesses as well and let's uh, try and get a banker here dcb bank venki is here venki for some businesses and you know some would say that it applies to all businesses the role of technology is critical you know banks online commerce financial services healthcare we just uh, heard nk say that so how can uh, or what are some of those specific challenges that banks face where you know having this very robust back end is critical to their functioning and having that trust with the consumer ashu very good question and uh, you know as uh, you know sorov and others were speaking i was just wondering i mean you know while there is so much talk about new technology ai aml and uh, the cyber space what is happening banks actually are at the cusp of the digital revolution as i would say the change is not uh, you know continuous it's actually a quantum change that is happening and if you look at the graph that uh, saurav put it where you know you had all the market players and e-commerce and uh, you know mutual funds every other financial services industry everything actually uh, you know is connected with bank because nothing happens without bank being involved in it and so two two aspects i want to first talk about you know first is building trust with technology the way probably the banks are dealing with is a zero trust scenario where you look at all transactions or all processes where there is no scope where you could say that i have a 100% trust i mean you operate from a zero trust scenario where you say is this a full proof scenario is this something that i can deal with that i think that's the start of the process second is from a regulator perspective also there is lot of impetus on how banks are adopting newer technology the plans that they have with is with regard to you know the cyber uh, crisis management plan the board members you know being educated about it the management being educated about it and more importantly how are you taking that to the customer and what we have seen is that the large part of customer education is so critical in managing or building that trust and often ashu what happens is that till a risk event happens you are actually not conscious about it you don't think that it could happen to us or it could happen to me and 
whether it's a phishing call or a wishing call or a you know any such incident people generally fall to either you know let's say it's a you know somebody who's a trusted person calling you know representing himself or herself from a bank i think those basic issues lead to more cyber or issues related to financial loss or any such events as long as the customers are willing to accept the awareness messages the dialogue and the comfort level that they can build on that i think we would be able to mitigate uh, the risk to a greater extent in fact if you look at the verizon and the ibm report largely only 3% of the cyber incidents actually happen because of exploitation of vulnerabilities 85% of the issues either happen either due to a human error or there is an involvement of an insider and when i say insider involvement i am not meaning that there is a you know conscious it also could be an omission so i think there are three four key takeaways that i can tell one is awareness and building tools and usage of ai ai and aml in building a very robust platform so that checks and balances are there we can't expect customer to know everything but build from a back end a zero trust scenario where there are enough and more validations that have been put in place to secure a transaction and secure the data sure correct okay so that's one part because banks and financial services companies as uh, when he mentioned it's, it's also going through that huge change these days media well i'd say that change has happened in the last two decades ever since the dot com times rajiv give us a sense of the challenges you face because you have to be more outward facing the organization a media organization has to be more outward facing and let as many people come in not quite as the way a bank would function i'd imagine right so so we have a different sort of a challenge ashu uh we were literally forced uh into i would say uh to change or transform although we started the journey of digital transformation around 5 years ago all the elements were in place but i was having a different challenge of people to adopt or trust the technology in the environment so when pandemic started i think there was no option with every anybody or everybody in the system to to adopt technology uh see uh, editors are creative people and they like to interact with people to make opinions and then they write stories on that now telling them go and sit in your home and we provide all the technology there was a sort of a shock to them as well so that was one aspect which we had to face because it was a sort of a culture change for them and uh, they have been, uh, they are used to the the humdrum of newsroom uh, following uh, chatting talking and all that stuff and that uh, i i could when discussing with editors i feel felt that was went on missing and they were facing the challenge of collaboration so one the collaborative platforms which we had in our en- enterprise all of a sudden the moment lockdown started in say march 2020 uh it went 1000% up the adoption which i have been like uh, sending notes send doing awareness session not happening this was like forced and it happened it was uh, not only at that level we saw uh, even our sales uh, team moving totally into visual analytics which we had in place we had cloud based systems in place and the adoption just shot up uh, like uh, whatever Uh, they had to the trust automatically built i think and we had to make sure the security parameters are in place uh, uh, also in our distribution channel uh, our customers were not used to paying uh, through online pay line payment modes so mm. we had introduced those aspects so a newspaper customer usually pay in cash or they have a subscription coupons based on which they pay uh, since the uh, this happened we started this online payment mechanism and i'm seeing 
a continuous increase in that particular RAF also as it goes. So come to think of it, I would say it was more of a, a push that happened from this environmental reasons why people went into it. Yes, on the technology front, we had to have those systems in place so that uh, they, the, the risk of any data loss or any compromise were minimized in the environment. Uh, but I would say that was the key driver that made the adoption very quick in our end system. Okay, let's also get comments from uh, Srinivas from Himalaya Wellness. Srinivas, uh, safety and security of data, and you're a consumer-facing organization, and the challenge I would imagine is slightly different. So if you can explain cloud or on-premise, what are some of those challenges that you faced in, and you continue to face in building that kind of an organization where that, you know, that bond with the consumer is like completely trusted. Good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for having me here. In recent years, we have witnessed a numerous emerging technologies like enterprise system, mobile, endpoint devices, big data, and blockchain, cloud computing, many of this. There are not only changing how technologies is being delivered, but also resulting in the changes to their entire business model. Now, what we see is next gen operating model is setting up the new norms. Now, speed and agility for faster time to market is the key. Uh, there was a time when IT was came into light only when uh, someone's uh, system froze up or uh, Outlook was not working. Now it's no longer like that. Uh, now there is a minimum requirement, acumen required uh, from the users, end user, IT acumen required from the end users also. Today we even have IT representation with the senior leadership teams as and as on board members. The bottom line is that as a society, we have adapted that IT not only enables business, but is essential to its survival, growth, and innovation. Now, speed and agility for faster time to market is the key. The boundaries between business and IT are diminishing, with companies relying more and more on digital technologies and digital businesses. The ways of working are being redefined. This is bridging the gaps in the function of business and IT, which we otherwise were operating in silos. There is a high dependency on digital and robotics, artificial intelligence. This requires workforce, uh, new workforce or new exper uh, expertise and competency required from everybody. The large, large volume of work are getting automated through the user self-provisioning and that automation and cloud as such. Accommodating these changing technologies and adapting to the changing changes in the continuous uh, technological change is a continuous journey. Post the COVID-19 pandemic, we are witnessing a paradigm shift already in the ways of operating with respect to IT infrastructure, changes, processes, and work from home model and the new modes of communication. So what we see is an, as an IT operating model to a, is a next gen operating model as an organization needs to ensure a strong leadership commitment for a continuous adoption of technological change, emphasize on modern delivery, like being agile, cloud and DevOps, and adapt to the continuous innovation. That's what I see uh, and my take on the deployment sure. of technology into okay. the business. Okay, Johnny, uh, building blocks, it's a term that I did refer to a little earlier. So how should companies look at putting that together so that the partners, you know, the partners of the companies and customers can be comfortable with the idea that this is an organization. And you know, you don't state that. The best way the customer would state that is continue to do business with you. 
Uh, um, first of all, I'm very pleased to be with uh, everyone here. As a um, technology vendor and someone who work on data and data protection, um, my role requires me to, to work with all industries across the world being responsible for our international um, business. And I'd like, you know, just to put a separation, and I think my esteemed colleague uh, kind of touched on it. There is the pre-pandemic and there is the post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, all businesses were aware that data is important to build their businesses on, and everyone had their digital transformation ready. And most of those plans were three to five years plans. Um, and people were working you know, based on the budget that's available, based on other priorities the business is putting, and digital transformation was something that they're gonna get to. They started working on it with a three to five years uh, outlook. However, when, when the pandemic hit, uh, and that was two years ago, um, what happened is businesses realized that, you know what, for us to continue working, what we need to do is to absolutely accelerate the digital transformation, because that was the only way to survive and serve the customers, regardless which industry you're, you're in it. And we've seen the world really do, do fantastic work in digital transformation. I mean, we've seen some amazing services being launched so we could continue our life. Now, what we have noticed though, because of this acceleration in digital transformation, something was created that we like to refer to as Veritas is the vulnerability lag. The focus to transform, digital transform, went at light speed and organizations were just focused on this. And as a result, there was a lag when it comes to security. Actually, we did uh, launch um, a survey with uh, around 2,050 customers globally. And it was also focused in India. We had 200 customers respond to us in India. And uh, the numbers are, are staggering. You know, we had 96% of the respondents in India say that they have at least one gap that was the result of them moving super fast. And when we double click on the lag, we realized that actually 65% was created in the cloud because people needed to embrace cloud, move into the cloud, but that created some lag from a security perspective for them. Uh, the second lag, um, which is no surprise, is a skills gap. You know, uh, uh, companies said, you know, as we moved into more cloud, as we moved into more DevOps, uh, like Srini mentioned now, um, uh, in, into, you know, all other technologies, they started realizing like they cannot catch up with the skills that they have. And this has created, you know, and it was, it became a, a perfect storm because with this gap that was created, the vulnerability gap, mm -hmm. uh, attackers also realized that uh, great, you know, more data is being created, more vulnerabilities are there. And that's why we saw the ransomware really ramp up uh, to, to unbelievable uh, place. And I'll, I'll share later on some of the numbers we have on, of what's happening with ransomware. So, uh, so this is where we are, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, unintended consequence of the speed that we moved with uh, is a vulnerability lag that we are trying to close uh, in today's world. Uh, so you've used a term that I really wanted to talk about as well, Johnny, because I wanted Saurabh to come in on that and talk about it. When you want to move at that speed, Saurabh, what are some of those challenges companies face? And is there a trend that clearly stands out for you, if you if you can uh, spell that out? Oh, yes. So um, there are four challenges that generally companies face. One is selection of technology, as there's so much of choice, which one to opt for. Second is the processes, that when you are implementing that technology, what kind of a processes that will be binding those together. The third is, people, uh, what kind of skill sets. Uh, now there's so many varied skill sets. If you do not pick up the right skill set to do the right job, then the whole speed of change uh, may slow down. And the fourth is ways of working. The whole way of working in today's world in order to attain the speed is wherein business, technology, and the whole consumer insights team work together. They are not silos. Now, how do you break that traditional mold of thinking and bring them together to work and deliver together? 
So these four things are something which is internally within the company. If not catered to slows down. The second is outside in perspective, which is macro. It's very important to keep a lens on the macro um, environment. First, regulatory. The whole regulatory lenses on technology, on data, on usage, on privacy uh, is, is evolving daily. Uh, the second is, is competition, wherein you may want to do something and maybe very fast, but then nobody is just waiting for, and they also come back. So how do you keep that lens and check on and integrate with your strategy? And the last, but the most important one, to do all this within the budget. So are you budgeting it right? So this is how this whole framework works. Budget, that's a word that often drives so many of those decisions. But as companies move fast, uh, when can, again, I come back to the bank example, uh, how does that moving fast versus being able to do that, you know, keeping some of the other limitations in my mind, challenge the functioning of a bank? Can you share that? And some of the challenges that you face, Venki. You're on mute, Venki. Uh, you'll have to put on your mic. Yeah, yeah. very good question, uh, Ashu. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the questions which, uh, or one of the points which Johnny mentioned about pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, I think <coughs> the, the whole process of digitization is really accelerated. And I use the word of quantum change that, that is happening. Uh, even within our bank, you know, the pace of change towards digitization is only accelerating. In fact, we use the term accelerating the digital agenda. So the digital agenda is pretty much there. And how do you ensure that in a manner that continues to not only build, but enhance the trust? So there are two or three points that I want to mention. One, when we look at the whole risk part of building trust part, there's some something that I want to say is that I don't know what I don't know or unknown unknown is given because there are so many things that are happening today that I don't know what I don't know and unknown unknown is really really the question mark. Uh, what is known there are enough and more tools that are available uh, we could build you know a lot of uh, you know you know support systems around that but how do you mitigate you know, some of the risks which are associated with accelerating the digital agenda? I would say there are two aspects to it. One is that how do you build systems? And when I say system here, I'm not talking about technology, but your readiness to handle a threat and recover from there. I would imagine that organizations need to work towards a system that attacks or risks would happen. But the recovery is far more important than the attack. So that is one building block that I would want to mention. Second is that security or a risk management, if it is a tick mark at the end of a digital launch, then we would always be left with a lot of unknown, unknown risk. If it is integrated right from the beginning, many a times what happens is that the security teams are the last one to know before a product or a services has to be launched. And how do we take that right at the beginning stage and they are part of the end-to-end -end process? This is the second building block. Third is, most important part is building awareness. And, and the building awareness could be a very simple thing, uh, which is about one simple click by an employee for a pizza or a holiday somewhere could actually mm -hmm. cost the organization a very big amount of money. And many of these risks that we are talking about, they are not related to sophisticated crimes or sophisticated attacks that would happen. People generally exploit a basic human error or an access to a partner, or you haven't done your due diligence of a partner and some time back, I talked about that banks are connected with almost everything and everywhere where the payments are connected with it. How the data and the transaction flow is happening if the entire end-to-end -end is not encrypted or it is open to attack by someone, 
I think not looking at those aspects when you are accelerating your digital agenda would really be suicidal. And I think the change uh, could, you know, for some, you know, you could actually have a pause to change, but not without putting these, you know, building blocks in place before you launch that. So I would say that it is easy to accelerate, but without factoring unknown unknown or make, making sure that you put basic stuffs in place, I think it is it is it is definitely uh, organizations should know that they are actually it's a risk, uh, they are heading towards a disaster. Okay, that's a challenge, and uh, also one of the challenges I'd imagine is the people. And you know, every company would like to have the smartest people, particularly with relate uh, as you build the capabilities for security as well. What are some of those people challenges, Rajiv, uh, if you can share, which limits that speed of change? Because again, we're trying to understand some of the better ways of working. So can you share that challenges that you face with respect to people? And when I say you, I mean the industry. And does the need for a new way of working, change way of working, is that the first step towards accepting the reality and then working smartly ahead? Yes, uh, I should, first of all, I'd like to uh, reiterate the point which Venki said. Uh, the first factor that we have to uh, work out is the resilience part of our environment. So attacks are inevitable. People will be careless. Uh, some of them do fall to phishing attacks, even if you run the best of the awareness programs. Uh, people get hoodwinked into that. And uh, that's a uh, social, people get social engineered and all that stuff does happen. So whatever care you may take. And in the current context, uh, when we see uh, the type of transformation we did uh, in last two years, in fact, when Saurabh was showing his uh, presentation, there was a small thing popping up there of one of the cloud proxy server. We have the similar one implemented for our cloud applications. Uh, so, uh, so one, people have to adopt to a complete new way of working from home because you are not amongst in the parameters of the firewalls of the organization sitting. You are sitting at homes. So the firewalls have to be uh, upgraded, transformed to cater to the uh, sort of uh, environment so that even when you are logging in from home through virtual private network, then multi-factor authentication, which you don't have to do it earlier. So that was a complete paradigm shift for the users, how they log in or connect to the enterprise applications, which earlier they were oblivious of. So earlier, if uh, there was a zero VPN usage, now it's like 6,500 people, the entire employee base is on. Uh, VPN and multi-factor authentication. So those things have become a new norm. They have understood that. Uh, yes, the factors now which come in is on the awareness program where you have to see uh, the, how you save yourself from the phishing attacks. Attacks do happen when they do happen. How quickly the IT or the information security team gets into action to uh, prevent any damage to the environment. So those have to be done. Systems are in place, but yes, some of them do pass through this uh, sort of, a, uh, what you say, a safety net. And so we have to have systems which can then somehow uh, uh, like contain that particular uh, risk that can be uh, become larger later on specifically during these times, like when we have these international and national events, then the attacks increases on our environment pretty uh, hugely. Mm. And till now, we have been able to ward off any uh, problems for our enterprise, but uh, uh, the teams, we have to take a lot of uh, a larger ecosystems where we have our partners. So we take along our partners with it besides our own security team, which is very lean as such. We don't want to spend on an in-house big team. Rather, we depend more on a 
partner ecosystems who can come in and have an updated skill and technology and they are able to upgrade us on a very uh, success uh, in a very continuous basis so whether it's a cloud proxy whether it's virtual private networks multi-factor authentication or backup systems like what veritas gives so that we have the resilience so that if something goes uh, god forbid gets into ransomware you have a clean copy available on uh, a backup which you can Im immediately mobilize so that you are uh, not hold uh, ransom too. So uh, I would say that's the strategy what we are doing uh, in, in terms of having a skill from across the industry to mm -hmm. cater to various uh, sort of a threats that keep on coming in the environment. Okay. I'd also like to know from uh, both Pankaj as well as NK about some of the challenges that they may have faced, some of the learnings, you know, Maybe with your experience, uh, Pankaj, would you like to share any experience which can be a learning for the rest of the industry where, you know, something could have been done better or something was done very well related to security, of course, the conversation we're having. So... Security is a multi-pronged approach. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, please. So security is a multi-pronged approach. It is not going to be like a single solution. It is going to take care of everything. So as we know that security is required at every end. The IT, IT landscape is built of application it is infrastructure and it is in the network and security it needs to be embedded into all of this. So, uh, so we need to take care that we don't compromise anywhere, especially now when everything is online, everything is integrated and you are not responsible for the security of your own organization and or your own, or, uh, own data. You are also responsible for the parties you are integrated. So, if I am vulnerable, then if I am integrated with other business house, they are they are also vulnerable. So we we have to be responsible for that also. There, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Venkatesh was saying, that if we are in the habit of uh, having security just a tick mark just before going live, then mm -hmm. of course we will not be able to achieve this. Uh, because uh, at that time, we would like to find some exceptions or we will uh, try to find some shortcut methods just to make the project live uh, at the largest. So it is a culture. There is a sea change. If, if we go 20 years back, at that time, security was only in the book. Okay, At that time, it was just that, okay, some something like this should happen, but we don't... Uh, actual work and actual practice, nobody was worried that, okay, this mm -hmm. is going to happen. But this is not so, the threat is real. And uh, we have to make sure that without compromise in every aspect, uh, we have to implement at every stage. And not only, only, only for us, it is for customer, it is for, I mean, C2C scenario or B2B scenario or B2B2C scenario, everything. We have to make, make sure that it is not compromised. So this is a habit. Tools are available. And uh, there are many specialized tools are also available. I mean, pre whether it is preventive or corrective. Okay, So that we have to see that depending upon the threat, how much we want to invest. But yes, wherever it is essential, that should not. So that is okay. my. And give any anecdote, any incident you'd yeah. like to mention? Sure. So I think most of the points are covered by the panelists. But from my side, uh, no, I would like to put it in you know two parts. One is that having a, a strong uh, strategy over the uh, around the IT security that is one aspect of this. And uh, you know, so there definitely there's a strategy, there's a the security platform, the different solutions, the softwares, and it has its own monitoring, management, maintenance mechanism around it. Where again, the people process technology aspects are part of that core IT security, cyber security framework. That's one that we should have definitely. Now, as one of the panelists said that any new implementation, any new solution we plan uh, for richer stakeholder, the customer or the internal stakeholder, 
security has to be an embedded part of that overall solution. Uh, normally, the, in the earlier time, you know, the CIOs used to go uh, for a separate budget for security, right? But today, when you go and present a solution, that solution has to have inbuilt security. Like when I'm, buy, I'm buying a car, I cannot buy a security separately and buy a car separately. So I have to buy a car along with all those security measures, you know. So uh, one is the technology aspect, and uh, the most important aspect is that you know uh, we need to have people to manage those kind of solutions, those tools. There are a lot of tools there. I mean, if you look at uh, what we have uh, as a cybersecurity security framework, there are roughly around 15 to you know 18 different solutions in place. Somebody has to understand those logs. Somebody has to understand the response time to it. So having a strategy in place, and uh, you know, uh, it is difficult for an organization like Manipal to have all the security expertise in house, right? So it is better to go to the people who uh, are best in managing uh, those kind of, you know, uh, or giving uh, managed security kind of solutions to the organizations. So implementation, ongoing maintenance management, and any solutions which we plan, it has to have, uh, uh, you know, security as an inbuilt component of it. And then most importantly, on a regular basis, we need to have those external audits, uh, the checks on those, the assessment part of it, and then the corrective uh, actions. So it's it's a sort of you know ongoing exercise. It is not one time exercise. So th that's my thought around the security. Okay, uh, Johnny, did I thought uh, you raised a hand? You wanted to come in? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, thank you. I'd like to comment on on a couple of very important points that were made. Uh, you know, Venki was talking about um, resilience and the importance of resilience. I'd like to support that with a little bit of data because it's a mindset. When it comes to security, we need to have the right mindset. The, again, the survey that we did in India tells mm -hmm. us that you know two things I want to leave you with. You know, when it comes to security, the, the first one, seven point seven outages came from human error. So you could have the best systems out there, but you know, approximately eight outages, outages happened because of human error. You know, that's point number one. The second point, and you know, we were shocked by the, the, the response, out of the 200 customers we spoke to in India, the total attack in 12 months on those 200 customers was close to 500 ransomware attack. So on average, 2.3 ransomware attack per company in the past 12 months. Uh, and 10% of the companies, so 20 out of the 200, uh, they were hit five times or more. Why am I sharing this data? I'm sharing it to say, it's a question of when, not a question of if. And this is where I go back to Venki's point. How resilient are we? So yes, of course, we need to do our homework and put all the securities in place and all the layers of security, but we cannot just count on that because it's as we've seen from the statistics, when it happens, and we're talking about trust here, and if you wanna maintain trust, you need to make sure that when it happens, not if it happens, how can you recover? And here I'd like to go back to Shorup's point when he mentioned there are multiple tools and NK also mentioned there are multiple tools, what do we do? But one of the things we we're seeing large organizations adopt is the ability to consolidate where they can consolidate. And here, as an expert on data, I'll, I'll give you an example. Again, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Post-pandemic, what happened is before data, and if I want to simplify it, data sat in your databases as a company and sat on your SharePoint and email systems. You know, I'm just simplifying it, yeah? Post-pandemic, what happened? It was that, but also cloud, private cloud, you know, employees at their own home started using their, their own cloud. They started using Teams for chatting more. We have some statistics showing us that they start using even WhatsApp for business, you know, uh, uh, communication. So what does this tell us? It tells us that data became prevalent everywhere in multi-channel, multi-places, not like before. And therefore, if we apply the, the logic of, you know, I'm going to use a different tool for a different system to back up my data, and nobody backs up for the sake of backing up. You back up because you want to be able to recover. Then imagine a disaster when it happens. You don't want to end up with nine tools, one system to recover the team's communication, another system for your SharePoint, a third system for your box, 
a fourth one for the cloud. So what we're seeing large organization adopt is work with, with partners or vendors that have a platform allowing them to back up the data regardless where it's sitting, you know, be it on physical, virtual containers, in the cloud, in private cloud, for the simple, simple reason that when ransomware attacks, you need to be able to use one command center to be able to recover that data into the multiple systems that you have. Because if you go with, I'm going to have multiple tools, imagine when you need to recover. You're going to be working with you know, multiple tools, and this is just a formula for, for disaster, You know this complexity. So this is what we're seeing. That's our experience. And again, the mindset we encourage our customers, you know, it's a question of when, not if. How ready are you? And I'd like to close with one just analogy. We all work for companies and we all know that uh, we do a fire drill, right? Every, I don't know, three months, six months in the building you're working in, they do a fire drill. Everybody knows what to do. You're the marshal, you meet here, you do. So we all know the, the process, right? Now, what's the similar approach? What's the drill if you are hit by a ransomware? Who do you communicate to internally, externally? Who launches the recovery? On which systems? Are you sure you have the? So is it written down? Have you done a drill? Do you know what to do or is it gonna be complete panic? Unfortunately, most of customers we work with, we start working with them to build those resiliency plans. So this is what I'm advocating for. Be sure. ready, it's a question of when, not if. Okay, when, not if, Srinivas. It requires a mindset change. That's very important for companies. What does it take for a company to go through that mindset change? So what here I would like to emphasize on the security governance. So security governance provides a framework for making risk mitigation decisions and ensure that security strategies are aligned with the business strategies. So. Effective governance of information security, in fact, provides assurance that security in initiatives are aligned with the business strategies and controls are in place to address potential risk. So as uh, Mr. Johnny Nandakishore and others were saying, telling us, data can be lost via corruption of viruses, ransomware. Rans as we know that ransomware is prevalent incident of malware today. Not only data security is important to success and reputation of our company, it is IT which goes under scrutiny when security event occurs. This means that your career is literally on the line. As a result, your storage or infrastructure architecture needs to be up to the task to maintain your data score. So the constantly evolving cyber risk poses the challenges to us to how to predict the motives of cyber criminals. Uh, boards now focus on effective governance of cyber risk through uh, delegating responsibilities and empowering the C-suite and compliance with the cyber laws and regulations is a key factor as it is a threat to loss of, loss of revenue and dimi diminished customer confidence. Historically, uh, we see that uh, organizations have focused mainly on technical aspects of security while uh, developing security architecture. However, given the security, severity and cyber in incidents in recent decades, security needs senior management's attention now. Mm -hmm. as information leak incidents can lead to million dollars of penalties, fines, and other costs which may result in loss of key customer confidence. And risk-based approach is very important now to deploy and identify, assess, mitigate, and report the risk and ensure that resources are used effectively and efficiently. So that's my take on the security point from the organization. Ankash, can I come in here for a few seconds, please? 
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So just to add uh, to what is already mentioned, you know, what the attention of the senior management and before we go to senior management is a CI was spending uh, uh, enough time to at least monthly review and understand the security posture in the trades and the response what he, what has gone, you know, to those trades from our system. I think that is a very important point. While we can create the awareness, but this has to be uh, there on the CIO's agenda to understand and spend some time to understand those threats, etc. Report to senior management and also uh, sort of fine tune the IT security strategy and policy according to the new threats which are emerging. So while we are creating the awareness for our employees and the users uh, uh, within this, uh, the the IT structure, there has to be a sort of you know leadership uh, under CIO who can drive the IT security. Uh, at least for you know mid to large size organizations so i think that's an important uh, point here i would like to also add as johnny was telling backing up your data is a first step restoring yeah. that data is the second the goal of any backup and recovery is to restore your company's operational data system at least the amount of time for in the least amount of time possible with least amount of data and financial loss for this, we need to have a robust backup and a DR system in place. Okay. Okay. So uh, coming back now, we're now talking about uh, the disruption and the challenges caused by, you know, the cyber attacks, which, you know, I just spoke about the numbers from, that CERT is seeing through the year. What are some of those best practices and particularly keeping in mind the increased threat over the last two years? What have you been telling uh, as you speak to companies? So, um, you know, there are three main major points. One, shift left culture. Shift left culture means any software technology or design that is happening in the com company primarily for business objectives, it has to have security by design. So which means that security starts from the house itself. The second is regular assessment and real time monitoring. So one of the things that generally company misses out is that let's say two years before I have done an assessment, I know that my health was good then. Uh, but today I, am, I haven't done it. So then you don't know where the health index is. So do you know your health index every year? And the third one is primarily to have that ecosystem partnership with the third party bodies who are experts that if the e events happen, then you are not randomized. You are pretty much with government, with third party, with expert agencies, you have that understanding playbook done earlier than post facto. So these are three things that we generally are putting in as a deeper strategy to safeguard a company and business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's the way uh, Saurabh explained it. It is very much part of a culture, a habit within the company. How does the company look to build that? So uh, there are two or three things that, that, that comes to my mind on what we do. One is building culture, as you all know, and you know, it's a slow process. And till it actually happens, you will never you know, respond to you know, a crisis kind of a situation. So we do two or three interventions typically, year on year or quarter after quarter, we would actually resort to a social engineering initiative we do master classes. Some of the master classes I would take on, on the uh, you know security aspect, giving them live examples of what would happen. Third is at the board level. There's also an expectation from a regulator that cyber security is an integral part of every board meeting or a you know significant board board agenda, and the board discusses that. So it's also part of what the regulator also does review. So right from the top, the tone from the top is about ensuring the security and it goes down to the management team. So it is no longer an agenda point only for the, the chief uh, information security officer or a CIO or a technology team. It actually is a bank's agenda. And I'll, I'll give you a background to this whole, whole journey. Uh, 
uh, in Bangladesh, the swift fraud that happened few years back, and you know, and I think since then, both government of India, the agencies like CERT, the IDRBT from RBI and the RBI teams and bank, they have built a very strong framework of information sharing, incident reporting. So if any incident happens, each bank needs to report within absolutely zero time to the regulator in terms of how this has happened. Many of these things are actually building skill sets, railroads for the institution to see that they have a robust framework in place. So, you know, as Johnny was saying that in, in his interaction with many companies, didn't find, you know, where there was an action plan. Now, we need to have as a part of a regulatory framework, as well as our bank's agenda, a cyber crisis management policy. So, which mm. actually details if there is a cyber attack, what are you supposed to do? Whom do you talk to? Do you get forensic examination done? Do you get... Uh, you know, some of the agencies to do more investigation. So the whole ecosystem, the way it is working, for example, if we do a campaign of, let's say people click on the links, you know, I mean, we actually go back to the people and say, look, you know, this is what you did and what would it cost the institution and things like that. And over a period of time, building this awareness amongst employees, the supervisors doing these master classes, and also sometimes taking punitive actions and I'm not saying the punitive action is the right way and always the right way of building the right culture. But I think making people aware that your one mistake could cost the institution quite a lot of money. And in the banking and the financial services industry, some of the incidents that we have seen happening is actually on account of one or two misses like what I just mentioned that you just happen to click on a link you just thought that you were getting some humble pizza free and, and it, it would create an issue. So I think it's about learning from there, reinforcing. No amount of uh, training is enough to say, look, we have communicated as of yesterday. And if I'm permitted to use some Hindi words, I would say that when you are driving on a highway and you say that uh, you see the board where it is written, Nazar Hati to Durghatna Ghati, uh, <laughs> which means that if you take your eyes off, off the road and, and the accidents would happen. I think cyber security or information security is like that. It has come to that stage where the security operation center and uh, rest of the people, the top management, the, the board, everyone, if they don't work in collaboration with external agencies like CERT, RBI, or IDVRT and other banks and they exchange information and learn from each other that look, an incident has happened. Sure. And, you know, this is how we dealt with it. I think that's what is helping build the culture. First awareness and then culture about, you know, building the railroads on this front. Sure, uh, Pankaj, I'd like to take your point about the board being, well, not just cognizant, but also uh, intent on action to make sure that this kind, a particular kind of culture and a particular kind of habit is built in the organization. How is that happening for your company? Yeah, so we are in a very, uh, I will say, uh, uh, exp experience from my company and I believe that uh, others are also experiencing so. So there has been a change and uh, now right from management uh, uh, to company board uh, they are very cognizant of the uh, of the risk factors that any company is facing and the risk which is which was earlier limited now it has opened up now we, mm -hmm. we are we are working 24 by 7 now we are uh, uh, all external entities are getting in now devices are not totally ours. It is not totally our control because users are using their own devices. Customers are interacting with our system with their devices. Network is not our control. Network is, this is public network that is being used to access mm -hmm. our, our application. So, and the impact is also huge. Our impact is in terms of business and uh, uh, business disruption. And most importantly, it is on brand reputation. So, because once that is com compromised, that is very difficult to do. And if you look at the pattern in last few years, the hackers or ransomware attackers, 
they also target the companies who are having uh, uh, i mean the bigger name in the market or the bigger brand major brand so that they also get popular of course any bowler will would like to take wicket of established batsman not a talented batsman. so they also target them all and so uh, what i have experienced that that now the full support is available earlier the information security which was looked as a hurdle of anything because it is only the only work of information security is that it can't happen i will i won't allow this and i won't allow that but now it is not so now people have a trust that whatever it is it is being done it is the best of interest Mm -hmm. it is for the, it is for the security now there i mean the total support of uh, board and uh, management uh, just to give you example earlier like you everybody used to build the disaster recovery etc so it was like a sunken cost mm. so, okay once a year or twice a year you do a drill and uh, then you are ju- you are just maint- maintaining data hardly use so it was more of a uh, sunken cost but now it is not so now that is a live uh, uh, very important cost where i i i, I will say that is inv- investment and there is expectation that now it will be a seamless work across even if, if if something happens it should be functional and there is so investment is not uh, um, pinching us i mean it is not biting us yeah. investment is real inv- investment that is going to give the business value yeah Okay, but also uh, I'd like to come to Rajiv and then to Srinivas uh, to talk about if you can share any experiences. Of course, I understand the sensitivities involved, where the learnings have happened after an incident had taken place. Can you share any, possibly without taking names? Okay. So, I should first I'd like to outlay the uh, sort of a business uh, ours is so. being the largest circulated english daily in the world and obviously also the business uh, newspaper also so we are a, a a big target as pankaj was saying so uh, everybody like to uh, make the big batsman out so our brand is known across the world and uh, we are the targets uh, whenever especially i was saying during the events happen so we have systems in place definitely the the most advanced of the firewalls the vpns uh, and all those we have security operation centers also in place we have the best of the managed services partners which nand kishore was earlier alluding to to have uh, and we have uh, though we are not a regulated uh, sort of a business mm. we have to maintain specifically for our brand value and mm. the trust that our audience or readers have in our uh, in our systems so so we have we have got uh, almost everything possible to prevent any sort of a mishap in the environment now what we do systematically one it our our reviews are even done at the board level so audit committee we have a regular uh, updates we have to give so i have a ciso also with me who who works very diligently we since our lot of our publications are in digital nature which go across to europe and north america so we have got gdpr and california laws and now the indian privacy laws that are coming up compliant mm-hmm. we also take one 27001 certification and for the next year we are also getting ready for 127701 i think that's the privacy with the privacy law that's coming up now uh, so that will also be there then we do simulations of phishing for our employees so uh, not just to uh, let them fall prey we do these simulations so once they fall prey we actually approach them make them go through a cbt the computer based training sessions to make them aware that this could be uh a risk and this keeps on getting updated as we go uh, almost every year we update it and obviously for uh incidents management or certain event that may happen we ac- also do war game simulation so that even at a ec as we call it executive committee level uh 
our our management is aware how and how to react in case of any such situation mm -hmm. now in terms of a uh, lot of uh, uh, what do you say news which is very confidential uh, what we do is we have prepared air gap systems so they are not connected so even if like our printing presses we have air gaps for them because uh, at night uh, 12 midnight till 2 2 2 and a half almost uh, 6 to 7 million newspaper gets printed we can't afford them to be hacked and newspaper uh, printing presses are very uh, somewhat are some some of them even carrying legacy softwares in them so and they could have vulnerability so we create air gaps for them similarly for certain news articles which are very critical and are prone to get hacked again for editors we create a air grip storage system so that they can't be they are not connected devices so a lot of these are taken and in spite of that uh, i remember we we uh, like 20, 20, 20 21 february we got a very heavy attack from uh, uh, somewhere from uh, whether it was routed through China or Russia zone. So there we got a lot of attacks from there. And it was like a brute force attack, which was simply uh, blocking our network, denial attacks and all those sort of started, a uh, lot of them happened. And we had to get in our partners uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was luckily it was a weekend. And then we were able to, uh, uh like found a solution to just thwart all those possible attacks that were happening and then we were able to like monday again that things were normal back in the office but yes uh, there are sophistications in the cyber attacks which are happening and sometimes we have to rally a lot of our our partners along with us to ensure that we remain safe uh, always so uh, I think that's one of the incident which happened. But yes, we we scraped through it without any problem. That's it. From the learnings, uh, Srinivas, would you like to share any incident uh, with uh, the details possible? Okay. That should we haven't had any incidents till date, as uh, we have been early adapters adapters of some of the latest technologies. So. We know that the user devices, applications, and data are moving outside the enterprise perimeter and zone of our control. Uh, we have, we know that advanced security goes beyond the prevention of unauthorized access and includes the controls of unauthorized access as well. So we have taken some of uh, security initiatives like uh, uh, what. Uh, Raji was saying that uh, we are also uh, conducting monthly uh, phishing simulation to all our end users. Based on the uh, uh, repeated offenders, we give them the training through our HR module. So that also is in place. So uh, other than that, we also ensure that some of our critical applications are not exposed directly onto the internet. We have a zero trust platform where the users have to do a multi-factor authentications to access those applications. So the priority is also to automate data protection with one solution that covers workloads across on-prem and the cloud and easily archive to the cloud scale to meet the enterprise demands. We had, uh, during this pandemic, we had a different kind of a challenge, though we had a technology in place to support the work from home for the users, everything. There were some departments who were, especially my design team and all, who works with the big Mac machines. So they cannot, we cannot send the Mac machines to their houses. Uh, to home to connect. So that was one challenge where we had to plan, ensure that uh, EDRs are in place in those systems, ensure the backup and move those systems uh, to their home 
so that there is no impact on the business for them to design the uh, all those the design team uh, work i think apart from that the one more challenge we had was we had an on prem uh, contact center so during the pandemic all our toll free calls used to land up on uh, our office premises and uh, there was some challenge um, moving it to during that time we had to adapt the cloud we rapidly adapted the cloud and moved the contact center uh, to the cloud so that uh, contact center users can take customer calls sitting at their home so this were some of the new learnings which we Uh, adapted during this pandemic other than that we have taken the priority was uh, during this uh, challenging time was the employees health so yes uh, of course yes uh, of course yeah our the company prioritized on uh, employee health from the point during this pandemic so that everything is taken care from the employee health point of view also they were uh, so this were some of the things which we learned during this pandemic apart from that we have have the uh, zero trust platform security model based on strict identification and verification pro- process that framework dictates that only authenticated and authorized users and devices can access the application and data at the same at the same time it protects those application and users from advanced threats on the internet so okay. as of now we have been handling it pretty well okay okay that sounds pretty good but uh, you noticed the number of times that term also came up with various companies as we heard them zero trust johnny that's a very important word that's that all security companies and all companies in the business and in fact all enterprises seem to be talking about zero trust and it also stems from the prevention is better than a cure approach what would you tell companies that should be a must have and depending upon the size of companies could be an optional as they go ahead with the way they implement their security policies and they plan against such whether it is a ddos attack whether it's ransomware or whatever um th- thank you great question um let, let me start first with um with some data to put things in in perspective um again you know when when we run our um uh, survey we realize that when it comes to data which is the crown jewels i mean we all agree that your data is the crown jewels at the end of the day 30 outside the database so the unstructured data 33% of data is dark so customer said we don't know where it is 50% were redundant obsolete or trivial and only 17% was business critical now why am i sharing this i'm sharing this because for you to put any plan in place you need to get visibility and i like to give the analogy you you must if you are the best fighter jet pilot in the whole world you get into your plane and you don't have your radar you're useless even though you have like an amazing machine with you all your training and what have you so the first thing we recommend get visibility understand where your critical data is that's number one the second thing we we like to advise is um, take it on a personal level take your phone whenever there is an upgrade for your phone for security you go ahead and upgrade immediately because you want to be protected now let's take this to the businesses how many businesses are running software that is not up to date they did not upgrade to the latest technology so we we start by the basics please upgrade to your latest technology that's the second one but when it comes to data protection and that's our specialty we always say think of 3 2 make sure you have three copies make sure you have them on two different mediums and make sure one of them is off site and now we added another one so it's now 3 2 1 1 the last one is make sure that you have data that is air gapped that is immutable because attackers when they come in they are smart they know you have backup they're going to go and delete it first and then do their stuff mm-hmm. so make sure you have an immutable one 
architect for zero trust, as you know, it was mentioned multiple times, uh, start by trusting nothing and then start opening as your business requires it and optimize for recovery. Again, if the attack happens, can you recover at scale? And how much of your recovery process is manual, is dependent on people versus automated? The more automated you are, the best, the better your recovery is. So make sure that you optimize your recovery and work with one platform that can help you uh, everywhere. And uh, last, you know, as I open, make sure you have total visibility. Where is your critical data? It's no longer in your database. It's sitting in multiple places in chat rooms and in what have you. Understand where the critical data is, because you know, as it was mentioned, also the government cares right now. There is a lot of compliance. There's a lot of privacy cool. rules. When the government comes and tells you, get me all the data about uh, Ashutosh in your systems, it's no longer you go to the database and say, here's what I have about him. It's about you know, all your data on all the channels. So get visibility. Without visibility, you cannot fly that plane. So start with the visibility and then apply the other advices we've given. Okay. So we have just enough time. Saurabh, I'd like to just us if you can just spend a couple of minutes on the agenda for the board, because it's important, it has to flow from the top. And for some companies that might just be a challenge, but what should be the top three priorities, if I may say so, for the board that you put it? So the first one is that be compliant with regulation and on data on privacy, um, that is one, and they are very much conversant today. Uh, the second is that every board today uh, has a view wherein whether my business is secure or not. So security is not just about InfoSec, there is a risk and security angle. And pretty much both are in the center stage for the board. And the third one is that they are cognizant of investing into this seeing the new regime of doing business in internet world. So pretty much now is the time to be innovative and try to get the whole solution uh, done well. Uh, board is uh, with uh, all the executives and pro professionals. Okay, that's, that's priority. Uh, obviously the top managements would like to listen to it. And of course they would be looking at the various aspects of some of those priorities. We just about have enough time for a closing remarks. A uh, few words that uh, Johnny would like to say. Johnny, it's over to you. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, um, I can't believe uh, 90 minutes just flew by. What a great conversation and, and great insights. I, I learned a lot from, uh, from this panel. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for it. Um, again, you know, as, as specialists on data, I'd like to close with just a few points when it comes to, to, to data. Um, the, the first one is early detection when it comes to your data. Make sure when, when ransomware attack starts, it starts by encrypting your data. It doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. Mm -hmm. If you have early detection, automated early detection through AI, this allows you you know, to react to it. That's that's one thing I'd like to highlight. Make sure you have that. I know we touched base about individuals and the humans and their mistakes. Eight out of 10 people don't come forward when they make a mistake. While, you know, we need to take actions when they do that, we also need to encourage people when you make a mistake, come early so we could do something about it. So start, start with that. Make sure you have a good protection in place of your data, including immutability, one platform regardless where the data is there. And the last thing we, we say, automate your recovery. Your resources are thin, your budgets are not growing, but your data is growing and the risk is growing. And you cannot fix that problem by throwing more people and more money on it. You need an integrated solution to help you automate the backup, automate the recovery uh, and, and make sure that it is immutable. And, and with that, you know, when a problem happens, you know you can go to your board and say, I'm 100% able to recover in data and continue our business. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Ashu. Thank you so much for, um, gentlemen, for all your time. I'm just reminded of 
a line from you know what I heard from security agencies. You know the the security agencies that occasionally I've spoken to. It reminds me of a line that I heard from them. We have to be lucky every day. The assassin has to be lucky only one day. Perhaps it applies equally to the IT world as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you everyone for being with us for this very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok.